Good evening, everyone, and welcome. I'm Jana Irwin, Head of Education at the Ulrich Museum of Art at WSU. And myself and the entire staff of the museum are honored to be a part of celebrating the outstanding accomplishments and scholarship of the students receiving awards tonight. We have had the privilege of working with many of the students being recognized through our Mary Joan Wade and Corey internship programs. And to all of you, well done. We are so proud of you. To the graduating students, we'll be following your careers closely over the coming years. And for everyone returning this fall, we hope to see you at the museum often. And don't miss our summer exhibitions opening May 20th, Art as a Superpower and On Vacation. If you have family members or friends who weren't able to join us this evening, the program will be recorded and available on the Ulrich Museum's YouTube channel. So now please welcome the director of the School of Art, Design and Creative Industries, Jeff Pulaski. Hi, Hi everybody and welcome. Hey, thanks, Jana. Hi everybody and welcome tonight to our third annual Art History Awards. Um, we have a great program tonight. And uh, before we get to that, I don't wanna take very long, but I do wanna tell, uh, say thank you to Jana Irwin and the Ulrich for all of their work in helping us to put this together. And um, Emily Christensen in the Art and Design Office has been a great help also. We're gonna be joined tonight by Bob Workman who taught a slow burn class uh, for the entire year um, that was uh, focused on an exhibition uh, creation. And a special thank you obviously to Brittany Lockhart who's spent quite a bit of time putting all of this together. And we really, really appreciate all of her efforts on the school's behalf and for our students. So thank you to everybody who's involved. I hope I didn't forget anybody, but um, again, I just have to say thank you so much for all of their work. Um, as I said, we have a wonderful keynote speaker uh, tonight who will share some of her own art history practice with you. Um, if you're watching us live, please, please feel free to ask your questions in the chat and we'll have a question and answer session um, at the end of the talk. So now I'm gonna hand it off to Brittany Lockard and um, she'll introduce our keynote speaker and get us started. Thank you guys for coming. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Brittany Lockard. I am Associate Professor of Art History and Creative Industries here at WSU and also the Area Head of Art History. And I am very excited to introduce Alexis Carr, um, our keynote speaker for the evening. Uh, I've actually known Alexis for a couple of years. I've seen her give presentations at a couple of conferences as an undergraduate. And I thought she would make an excellent speaker for our students. Um, you guys should take notes. Um, I think she's gonna be very inspirational. She comes from a similar educational background uh, to you guys. And you can um, see that she has a pretty impressive resume for someone so young. So Alexis is a, an incoming um, second year master's student and a Chancellor's Graduate Fellow at Washington University in St. Louis. She received her BFA in Studio Art with a painting emphasis and minor in Art History from Missouri Western State University. She has held internship positions at institutions including the National Portrait Gallery in Washington, DC, and Nelson Atkins Museum of Art in Kansas City, and Art Forum Magazine. She is interested in the convergence between art, history, commodity, and the Black female experience within the United States. Her areas of interest include 19th century American art and art of the Harlem Renaissance. Um, one last reminder before Alexis starts that you can ask any questions you have for her uh, in the chat and we welcome that. So uh, with that, take it away, Alex. Thank you, Dr. Lockhart for that gracious uh, introduction and thank you Wichita State University and the Ulrich Museum of Art for inviting me to speak here today and for allowing me to participate in this um, truly uh, incredible celebration of art and art history students. Um, I think it's amazing that you have this uh, type of forum for, for this. So, so thank you for inviting me. Um, and so to, to just begin, um, this moment in time calls on all of us to reflect on resilience and justice. Each of you has made it to this point because you have demonstrated your capacity for resilience. 
Like all of you, this spring semester brought many challenges. It began with the continuation of a global pandemic, the aftermath of the insurrection on the United States Capitol on January 6th, the inauguration of a new president, and a string of mass shootings, including one in Georgia, which appeared to have targeted the Asian American community, and the trial and conviction of the police officer who killed George Floyd. All of this national trauma happening in less than four months. This time has made me think about what justice means and what it looks like and what its limitations are. I began to contemplate about how, um, about what justice means in the context of the museum space and reflect on how my own experiences will impact that construction. I started my undergraduate education, uh, my, my journey, uh, taking courses at my local community college. After struggling to complete coursework and even having to take a academic leave of absence, I finally got myself on track and was able to transfer to Missouri Western State University in 2016. And it was there that everything for me changed. Um, with the support and the guidance of some incredible professors and an amazing advisor and mentor, Dr. Madeline Rislow, I began to find where my future was in a career in the arts. Uh, prior to this, um, I had no idea um, really where I was going and what I wanted to do. Um, and I didn't think that art history was something that, that I could do. Um, I didn't know. Um, I didn't know any art historians personally or even how to become one. Um, so after much research, I learned that on top of my art history coursework and uh, completing my, my degree, I would need museum experience. And for me, however, this was a challenge as, um, as it, I found out was a sort of initial barrier. Uh, because of my financial circumstances, I couldn't afford to apply to many internships because they were unpaid. But uh, fortunately, I had the support of the School of Fine Arts at my university. And thankfully, um, even just this last year, um, there's been a huge change uh, for cultural institutions and art museums to abolish unpaid internships and replace them with paid ones. So luckily going forward, you all um, will be able to benefit from that. But, um, but this was crucial um, in creating a pipeline of museum professionals who are diverse and reflect the communities in which these institutions serve. So I started taking advantage of local opportunities within my university, uh, like conducting student faculty research, um, establishing an art history club on campus, and even interning at my local art museum, uh, which was the Albrecht Kemper Museum of Art. And all of this experience gave me the foundation and the confidence that I needed to apply to more competitive um, opportunities. And here I would like to say, um, all of you, like to all of you, just, just apply. Apply to things, whether or not you feel that you are 100% um, absolutely qualified and just never, um, never sell yourself short. Um, um, change slide, please. And so after months of putting together applications and being rejected a lot, um, sometimes twice in one day, um, I received a call in March of 2019 from the Smithsonian informing me that my application was successful and that I had been offered a position as one of six uh, Katzenberger art history interns. And I spent that summer in Washington, D.C. at the National Portrait Gallery, where I conducted object-based object base and biographical research on an 1872 copy of William Still's Underground Railroad. And my research on this object included reading the accounts of formerly enslaved African-Americans. And this was truly heartbreaking, but within those pages, um, conceived from the pain of generational trauma was a sense of gratification. There I was working at an incredible institution of art, reading these accounts from black men and women who could have never imagined such opportunities for their future generations. And it was also gratifying knowing that I contributed to ensuring that those women and men got to claim their deserved real estate within the space of, of the National Portrait Gallery. Uh, change slides. I would encourage all of you also to take opportunities to spend some time in uh, major art cities um, around the country or even internationally. Um, having access to incredible institutions of art all within a short walk or train ride really made me understand that all 
that, um, that not all museums are created equal and that they will have different priorities when it comes to issues of equity and accessibility. Uh, change slides. During my internship, I was also inspired by the number of women who spearheaded um, important in art institutions in Washington, DC. However, the lack of women of color in these high level positions um, was stark. This experience set the groundwork for my path of wanting to make the art museum a more inclusive and accessible space to all. This internship would also have implications on the research that I would engage in as a first year graduate student, as you will see shortly. Uh, change slides. During my first year at, um, at Washington University in St. Louis, I completed a remote internship with Art Forum uh, magazine as a editorial research intern. And here I got to read over exhibition reviews, top 10 picks, and even some uh, longer um, format essays. This experience showed me the process of how art criticism at the highest level um, is written. And as, as a student, that was um, crucial, um, especially um, as a first semester graduate student. Um, and it also uh, showed me how important it is to have more voices and more stories told in the arts and that it can't just be um, a certain group of people that are always writing, writing the narrative. Uh, change slides. Most recently, this past spring semester, I interned for the education department at the Mildred Lane Kemper Art Museum, which is the uh, art museum associated with Washington University. Um, and here I engaged with projects which made me consider issues of museum access and accessibility, but also issues of diversity and inclusion. One such project that I was tasked with developing was a virtual tour for an exhibition um, on the multi multidisciplinary artist and activist Christine Sun Kemp, uh, entitled Stacking Traumas. Kim's practice explores sound and how it is valued in society from her perspective as a member of the deaf community. Her diagrammatic drawings incorporate American Sign Language and musical notation as a way to examine sound as a mode of visual representation and different states of emotion. In Stacking Traumas, Kim identifies three sources of trauma for deaf people, dinner table syndrome, hearing people anxiety, and Alexander Graham Bell. Adapted from a drawing, um, the, this 25 foot high mural scales the curved wall of the Kemper's Salomon family atrium. This tour um, that I created explored uh, Stacking Traumas in relation to other recent works by Kim. And Kim deploys this subversive wit, which really calls attention to obstacles facing the deaf community and to celebrate deaf culture. Um, and while I was researching this project, um, I, I had to learn a, a lot about the deaf community and, and really learn that it's their community like any other is, is not a monolith. And there's these really um, dynamic discussions that are happening about what deafness means and um, and what access uh, looks like for, for, for the deaf community. And her works are also a entry point into the broader dialogue about deaf culture, um, the systemic marginalization of the deaf community and accessibility in the arts. Uh, Kim's layered references to music invites us to consider musical notation as both a visual of sound and a language of communication. In doing so, the mural explores the relationship between musical notation and ASL, both visual spatial sign systems that require specific training uh, to access their meaning. Um, and this juxtaposition of text and visual language challenges spoken language position in the communication hierarchy, shifting the burden of translation onto, non onto the non-signing viewer. Stacking traumas functions as an intervention in the museum inviting us to consider the responsibility of museums and galleries, many of which lack deaf programming and staff who are part of the deaf community. Um, and, and this is all to create a more inclusive and accessible art world. And what's really great about um, the opportunity that I had to work in the education department to develop this, um, this virtual tour was that this exhibition can now live on. And so even after the work um, comes down, 
um, there'll still be something tangible that that people who want to visit the museum can can refer to. And this is absolutely um, critical to making sure that voices and more stories are permanent, that, that they're a permanent fixture within the museum and, and its collection. Um, and so, yeah, th this was just a really impactful experience as well. Um, and then I also, um, oh, change, change slides. Yeah, and so then um, I also got the opportunity to work on a second um, project, which is a little bit more independent. I got to uh, choose what I wanted to, to work on. Um, and so I worked um, uh, on research on researching an object within the Kemper's collection um, that could be developed into some new education materials. And so I began research on George Caleb Bingham's Daniel Boone escorting settlers through the Cumberland Gap. Um, and this was really important to me uh, because 19th century American art um, has a problem. Part of it, um, part of which is rooted in its visual links to white supremacy and the other part um, in how works from this period are being presented to the general public. And so with the rise of the alt-right movement um, who, who are co-opting the visual rhetoric which made a painting like this and many others from this time period possible, and they're turning it into political rhetoric. And so this is why I believe that an, inter an intervention of these image is um, necessary and crucial um, at this moment. Um, and so that's part of why I wanted to focus on um, this painting to, to develop some educational materials. Um, also particularly because this painting carries, um, um, or, or it has a great um, status within the museum. Um, it's, it's one of the paintings that gets used a lot in museum teaching, um, especially at the, the elementary school level um, and the younger grades. And so that was also why I felt like it was important to focus on this work and really create some educational materials that would really um, present a, a critical lens that, that now um, museum educators can, can use when, when this work is being presented. Um, and so my goal with researching um, and investigating this painting was, like I said, to produce a critical lens, which this and other objects from this time period could be thoughtfully considered and displayed. Uh, change lights. Um, oh, sorry. Uh, go ahead. Yeah, it's right. Sorry. Um, and so when I look at works like Daniel Boone escorting settlers through the Cumberland Gap, I'm reminded just how much art can function not only as a site of memory, but also as a site of trauma. And so this is how um, sort of both of the projects that I um, worked this past spring on, um, how they really connected and, and intersected um, because these projects were both um, getting me to, to consider issues of visibility and, and invisibility and who is being um, erased, not only in the work itself, but in the space of the museum. Um, and so uh, museums, they, they have an obligation as stewards of our shared history to tell more stories and to tell them more honestly. Um, as a result, these objects can then be presented to the wider audience without the opaque varnish of a mythologized nationalism, which um, this painting definitely uh, displays. And how can art museums and other cultural institutions like um, the Mildred Lane Kemper present our collective, his, uh, our collective human experiences and histories of exclusion through making the once visible uh, the once invisible visible. And so that was really um, my, my goal this, this semester in thinking about these works in relation to just the current moment um, that's, that's happening. Um, and this is just one question that I hope to um, address. It's obviously a, a huge question. And so it isn't gonna be something that, um, that I will just be able to answer, but I definitely feel um, that I, I also have an implication as someone who who wants to get into um, the the museum field to to contribute and um, and to do something that is going to to be for the good of of the museum guests and, and their experience. Um, and so um, part of uh, what I was also developing with this was um, sort of strategy. And so. Um, museums can start um, to address some of these issues by examining their own collection holdings um, and the current state of their research on those projects. 
And so by doing this, they can establish their collections gaps in representation and subject matter. And this will also help the museum uh, to establish both their historic and current ac uh, acquisition priorities. Um, and this is critical because um, museums, they, they need to, to, to confront their histories. And so by confronting the possible deliberate practices of exclusion or erasure within collections um, is, is the critical first step to dismantling the structural barriers which keep 19th century American art collections a predominantly white male space. Um, and so to, I guess, uh, uh, conclude and go on to the next step, um, I would just like to say uh, to all of you going forward um, down your own individual paths to, to use your voice, um, take up space and be confident in your capabilities. Um, so thank you. Um, uh, so Brittany, um, if you would be so kind to, to join me to moderate questions, I'd be happy to, to answer any questions anyone has. Yes, thank you for a really um, fascinating presentation. And uh, I'll moderate a little Q&A. Feel free to drop questions into the chat box. Um, but I actually have a couple while we're waiting for them to come in. Um, and the first one is, is there any research that you're working on right now? And in particular, are you still thinking through the Precious Moments Chapel in, in Carthage? Yeah. So. Um... Yeah, so I definitely plan to continue the work on uh, the Bingham and hopefully develop um, develop it into a longer um, either paper or qualifying paper maybe for um, for my program. So it, it definitely is a project that um, I intend to um, expand upon. Also, maybe bringing in uh, since I'm so close to the uh, St. Louis Art Museum. So also maybe looking um, at their collection sort of locally, and then even expanding it beyond because it obviously isn't just um, it isn't just the the Kemper. It's it's uh, many museums and institutions. And and yes, I'm I'm always thinking about precious moments. Um, it's uh, I I don't think um, I'll ever <laughs> uh, stop. Um, which, which I think uh, is is a good thing because there there's art historical value there um, as well as with with anything else. Uh, I think maybe you meant article instead of paper because you're ready. Um, <laughs> we have a question from I feel like this is your life from a special uh, attendee, one Dr. Madeline Rislow. Um, asks how has your work as an artist impacted the way you view art history. Yeah, that's a really good question. Thank you. Um, so I think um, as far as uh, my practice, it definitely, um, art history has definitely made me more informed, a more informed artist, uh, because it's made me understand um, sort of where, um, where these visual legacies um, are coming from. So when I'm looking at, at something, um, I can, you know, sort of identify that and put it into this historical context um, and know that um, that people have been grappling with these issues and these problems and um, and ideas of, of representation um, since forever, right? And so, uh, yeah, so it definitely has had um, an impact on, on my practice there. And then also um, art history, when you study it, you um, you just sort of like create this um, internal Rolodex. And so you just kind of like, oh yeah, I'm I'm thinking about um, space, like, like, like this artist, or I'm wanting to um, maybe incorporate something really interesting and innovative that, that I've seen before um, in the classroom. So, yeah. Um. We have another. Uh, I'm curious about what contemporary critics and other art writers you're reading right now. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, this semester, um, it's it's gone by so fast. But uh, yeah, the, the, there was a lot of readings um, that I that I had to do. Um, just thinking about um, just some of them that have really uh, impacted me. Um, Freeberg and um, WGT uh, Mitchell, I believe, just um, just thinking about uh, the power of, of images and and what um, and what they mean and what representation looks like. So those are the kind of um, uh, 
people and, and critics that I'm really interested in, in reading, reading more from. Um, someone asked, what is your dream job when you finish school? Um, I don't know. I guess I'm, I'm kind of cynical. Like I don't necessarily believe there's like a dream, um, job, uh, I guess necessarily. Um, nothing is, um, perfect, but what I would just love to do and spend my time doing, um, would be, um, in a museum, either in, I think, a curatorial capacity or education um, capacity, some uh, some way that really uh, mixes both my interests of not only research, but uh, being sort of that first initial point of, of contact that museum visitors have. Uh, because for a lot of people, they go into a gallery space and that first point is the label, especially if they don't know the work they're looking at at all and have no no context or reference. It's, it's the educational material that they're um, besides the, the work itself that they are experiencing coming in, cont uh, in contact with. And over this past semester, I really um, learned just how crucial that that point in, in sort of like the chain is. And so, um, so yeah, I, I'm still figuring, <laughs> figuring it all out, but um, something like that. Um, has the museum started using your research on the George Caleb Bingham? If so, how are the docents responding? Yeah, so, uh, yeah, so it is something that I'm wanting to develop um, into an educational component. Um, we really haven't decided yet, but it, it uh, is in the works like that is what we're having discussions about is like, okay, what, what can we um, now do with it? Uh, so I'm not 100% sure yet um, what that is actually going to look like. Uh, but yes, there is definitely the, the intention of there being um, some new material. And, and that's also part of why I did it is because um, there is a lot of um, um, a lot of uh, unwillingness, I think, in some spaces to to challenge and and um, and reconsider uh, some of the the long held um, notions of our like mythologized past and and in our history. So um, I, th I think that's part of why also I, I kind of wanted to do it because um, it is uh, an object that gets brought out a lot um, when dealing with uh, education and, and teaching. Um, and so that's, yeah, that's part of why I, I wanted to investigate it too, because um, if, if this is what we're going to use, right, to, to talk about this, this time period um, in American history, and we're going to use it as sort of a um, an illustrative example of, of not only this artist, but this time period um, and like just new cla uh, classes, of, like just in general, like what does that mean? And, and, and what is that saying, especially to, to, um, to younger audiences? And so, I mean, yeah, I'm sure there'll be um, pushback, but I don't, I don't mind. Uh, so you've had a lot of success, which you've talked about. But can you talk a little bit more about failure and um, maybe give us some advice for dealing with rejection? Yeah, so um, a, a funny thing about that, um, you know, you'll you'll see the the successes, but as I um, I think I mentioned in in my talk for for everyone, um, sort of like good good news, there there's about 10, like 10 to 15 rejections that, that happened before that. So um, definitely uh, persistence and it only takes takes one, right? It only just uh, takes takes one yes. Um, and and sort of the the rest is history. Um, you can go from there. Um, yeah, and and I don't I it's <laughs> it's kind of uh, corny uh, to say, but I don't um, now having having sort of the the, the benefit of, of hindsight, I, I realize that rejection, um, it isn't really that. It's 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 sort of like a redirection, right? Like you're you're not able to um, you know get get everything, but like I said, you just you know one opportunity um, is enough, and um, and that's where you can can make your mark and and make the most of it. Um, so yeah, and just apply apply to all the things because like I said, you you never know. Um, don't count yourself out. Um, and tell yourself no before someone else has. Uh, it's like I paid you for a segue. Um, so we also have, I love that you encourage students to apply for things, even if they aren't qualified. How did you get the confidence to do that for yourself? 
Um, I think a lot of it was I just uh, sort of removed myself a little bit from the process. Like I said, I had I had tremendous support um, behind me, so so that helped. But I think I also um, just sort of like removed myself from the process. I just felt like, well, since since they would just be rejecting like a piece of paper, it's it's okay. So I don't have to really um, care. Like it's just you know a nicely worded email, so it's it's fine. It's not gonna hurt. So um, I'm sort of um, yeah, just just look at it that way too. Like it, like what's the the worst really that um, that it's gonna be? So uh, one of our um, aspiring students has asked, "What has been one of the more challenging things about graduate school?" Um, that's a really good question. Um, I think I'm still fi figuring that out and learning. Um, but um, I would say the the balance uh, between getting work done and having a life outside of that. And I think um, having to take courses online this this year has really sort of um, exacerbated that because we're all sort of now like we're living, you know, um, we're living through this moment and you know the lines between um like your work life and your home has sort of become blurred like right like you you guys are sort of in my my personal space but but you're not um so it's it's sort of this this blurring that's really happening and that has definitely bled over to um really having to to, to have myself take take a step back and say okay no no you need you need a break you can't um work you know seven seven days a week on on something it's it's fine like you're you're not a machine um so um could you tell us what museums you think are doing the best job right now uh, on diversity and inclusion issues yeah that's that's um definitely a hard one um uh it's kind of hard to say just like um from like the outside sort of looking in but um a couple of notes that um I think are in the right direction would be uh recently uh, the Baltimore Museum of Art um them taking deliberate um steps and and practices and how they're collecting art to make sure that um they're diversifying it with more female artists and, and artists of color I think that that is um I, I think that's the tell tell sign is of of if a museum is doing um, the work is okay. Show me show me the receipts. Show me show me your practices. Um, you're you're collecting. You're you're hiring. Um, so that's just one off the top of my head that I know of. That's um, at least on the collecting side is is um, trying to um, to correct um, the historic practices. A question from an art education major. What are your thoughts in reaching out to African American and other children of color, introducing them to artists who look like them and how those artists have contributed to art history in the past and now? Yeah, no, that that's definitely um, a great question. And that's that's the problem, right? Um, it's it's the pipeline issue um, that that is um, gotten art history to to the place it's at, I think, uh, because there has been sort of this siloed focus of the type of people that can get into art history. Like that's part of why um, I didn't think I, I necessarily could because um, it, it it always felt um, like one of these uh, spaces that was sort of um, untouchable almost. And, and to sort of have that demystified was really, um, critical for for also that that confidence um boost if we were um, referring back to that is just knowing that there's no reason why i can't be in this space um and there's no reason why any of you can't either um uh but yeah going back to um to the question yeah seeing seeing helps make um help helps expand what you think is possible and so yeah we need to um, definitely address that in the classroom, and that's part of why um, I wanted to, like, to go go back to to the Bingham to to tackle that work because that's part of the issue um, is what is being presented and and how can we sort of recontextualize this and reevaluate um, these 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 values that are being perpetuated that that are harmful because if you go to a space that seems um, 
uh, quite frankly, hostile. Um, yeah, you're you're not going to want to want to go back. So yeah, it's it's definitely is an issue, and that's part of um, where I would like to to contribute um, also. And it's yeah, it's it's a big question. So I I don't know if that, that's really answering it, but. Um, do you have any new projects or research that you're incredibly excited to tell us about? And if so, what are they and what's so exciting? Um, yeah, so other than uh, the Bingham painting, um, this past semester I was in um, a class called uh, Spectacular Blackness. And so the project, um, uh, the paper that I wrote for that, um, I got to really um, investigate uh, issues of representation and identity uh, through the context and lens of hip hop culture. And so I sort of did this uh, juxta juxtaposition between um, Little Nas X's Montero and uh, Botticelli's uh, St. Sebastian. Um, so that was part of the, um, the, the paper that I wrote, which is really great. Um, and then also, um, I also, a part of that paper brought in um, Young Thunder's paintings, which was really great from, um, I think it was 2018, Art Basel, Miami, and then um, the Carter's um, video. So yeah, so that was a really great um, exploration and that paper I also hope to, to expand upon because um, yeah, it was just absolutely great getting to uh, really delve into queer theory um, in particularly and really um, uh, deconstruct that video, um, so. Yeah, that, yeah, that's probably exciting. I love, I love that Saint Sebastian is such a queer icon. Um, shows up in all kinds of like the swimming scene, the George um, Bazile swimming scene. Yeah, he's, that's a great project. Uh, what role models do you have that have inspired you to keep striving? I mean, mom. <laughs> Um, but yeah, so, um, yeah, family, um, friends and just incredible, um, mentors and, and peers. Um, I think it's, um, one of those things where, um, you kind of feed off on each other. And so I think being able to have people, good people in your life who are supportive and who, um, who are always there just, you know, shooting you up. Uh, an encouraging text or something. I know I have that um, in my life. So that's um, really helped me because uh, this this time has been particularly isolating. Um, and so that's that's been a challenge really um, reaching out to people and, and having those connections. Um, yeah, it's it's just been friends and, and family and in my life really. I'm gonna use moderator's privilege to ask a follow-up question, which is, um, it's probably been, I mean, I'm sure it's been really hard because of the pandemic, but what advice do you have for our students, especially our, you know, our BIPOC, our LGBTQIA plus students about going to graduate school? How do they find their, their cohort, their group that's going to help support them through that experience? Yeah, um, I'm, I'm not going to lie. Um, it can be a lonely um, place. Um, being one of you know few and in some instances only a uh, person of, of color in in a space but but I think that is where um you should sort of like double down right like I I refuse to let um let that stop me um personally from from asserting myself in, in those space, because if I don't, well, then it's always gonna be that way. Um, and then the next person that comes along is also not gonna see somebody um, in that space. So I think, um, yeah, so I think we, we each have um, sort of an obligation to do whatever little part we, we can. Um, so if I can be in a space um, that, that might make someone else feel like they can and encourage them to, then yeah. And they should. So I think, yeah, double down on, you know, taking up space. Like don't don't let the fact that um that you maybe think it it isn't um stop you. Um so I think we have time for uh two more questions and we're gonna wrap up and give out some awards. Um so penultimate, how would you characterize current art historical practices in relation to revisionist art history of the 1960s? especially with regard to museums, which um, are your area of specific interest? 
Yeah, so there is definitely um, an issue with that. Um, sort of uh, going back to the, to the Bingham, when I was looking through the object file, um, I noticed just in the titling practice of, of that work, there was sort of this revisionist um, whitewashing of of um, of the painting and um, and the context of of Daniel Boone and and his legacy. So yeah, so that is definitely um, an issue. Um, I think part of addressing that is um, being someone who's willing to um, to identify that and see it and bring it up. Like that's why it's important to have um, diverse voices and spaces, uh, diverse people in these spaces, uh, because if if you don't say it, um, sometimes these things go unnoticed. So I mean, as as far as that, yeah. <laughs> um, which is the again a great segue for our final question your work in museum education is an example of an important way to reframe art history how do you get new audiences through the door of the museum to see this work when many people still don't feel like it's a space for all in other words um, how can museums be more inclusive of all audiences Yeah, so I think part of that um, is having art on display that people want to see. I think sometimes uh, museums they get so stuck in um, in in their old ways, right? Like they're like, well, no, we we have to have you know this work and this work and this work. Um, but I think uh, being willing to to challenge that sometimes and and push back and say, well, why? Like just because. Um, things have always been a certain way doesn't mean they always have to be a certain way. Um, and so, um, so I think it starts with that, um, reconfiguring gallery spaces. And that's also part of um, what I was investigating and looking at with the Bingham, because it's next to um, a Thomas Cole painting, which uh, happens to depict ruins, um, ancient Roman, uh, Roman ruins, and is sort of like, um, uh, was like a warning um, to like the fall of empire. And so that kind of got me thinking about the the rhetoric of a nation in decline um, and how that juxtaposition between the Bingham, um, which is sort of a depiction of an empire expanding, right? Um, and this westward expansion and um, sort of like manifest destiny, like how those two works are having a conversation with each other um, because we hear that all the time now, right? Like America in decline. Um, and so um, it just made me think about how that rhetoric from the 19th century is still so present today and getting audiences to be able to engage with that and understand that history is actually present. Like it, it, it hasn't stopped um, and we're actually part of it now. Um, was really um yeah interesting so i think yeah part of it is is the space too like it's not just the wall text and um and the educational materials that are online but it also is the physical space and so i think museums they have to be willing to um, reconfigure the space so like for the kemper um you know they some smaller institutions like they they have what they have right and so um they have to be willing then to maybe um, be flexible, right? Like be flexible about what they're putting in their gallery space and maybe not necessarily stick strictly to chronological um, order of things because I think it would be great in that space considering that it's um, all white men that are uh, that have their work displayed in that gallery to maybe even have some of the contemporary native um, art there to sort of um, assert more voices in, in that space because, you know, when I sort of looked you know, back and forth between those those paintings, and and I was standing there, like I could, I could hear, um, you know, just that rhetoric of of America um, in in decline, and like this rhetoric of like taking back um, a country and a nation, and then I and I know if I felt that way, then um, that that could be something that someone else could could feel looking looking at those works together too. Um, thank you so much, Alexis. This was just absolutely delightful. Um, and I would love to chat with you all evening. Uh, but <laughs> I um, am also very excited to give out some art history. Yes, thank you so much. And um, congratulations to to all the studio art and, and art, art, art history students. You all 
um, deserve this this night, and thank you for for letting me participate. Um, so I just want to say a little bit about these awards, which we started doing three years ago to give some visibility to the students who are doing great things in art history. Um, frankly, because I was a little jealous of all the ways that um, graphic design and studio and art education majors get to show off in their uh, critiques and by posting their work on the wall. Um, and I just, I didn't think anyone would stop to read an art history paper. Um, so we're going to kick off the awards with outstanding performance in an art history course. And I just want to say this was really, really hard to narrow the field down this year because it has just been unimaginable and um, all of our students have struggled with the online format, with job loss, with loss of family members from COVID. Um, and so I really feel like anyone who took part in an art history course uh, gave an outstanding performance in an art history course. So um, congratulations to all of you for, for finishing the semester and um, thanks for sticking with us. Um, and with that said, let's get started with our first category. So our first um, winner is Olivia Babin, who I've had in a couple of classes now. Um, and who never fails to go above and beyond um, the expectations um, and email me questions about the readings. Um, and she's just all around a really inquiring and amazing students. Uh, so she'll be receiving a book on Andy Goldsworthy called Touching Nature. Um, congratulations, Olivia. Uh, our second award winner is Devin Carter, who was actually nominated by both myself um, and Professor Claudia Peterson, who is currently on a road trip, I think, to Arizona. Um, so in my class, uh, Devin has done some outstanding participation. Uh, I had students recreate famous artworks and he gave me, um, in addition to an amazing colossal head, just an, an, he made an outstanding Venus of Kelowna. Um, so thank you for brightening my day uh, and congratulations to Devin. Sam Gales, uh, I think is much beloved, not just uh, by me, but by the Ulrich. Uh, she has given really great discussion boards and given feedback to her peers and like every one in an amazing way. Um, she even replied to most of the class, which is just above and beyond the call of duty. So um, thank you, Sam, uh, and um, congratulations. Uh, our next winner is Gabriella Levine. Um, Gabriella uh, not only has been doing great work in her art history classes, but I know she was in a research seminar and she and her whole cohort um, were researching sort of social pressure on young women um, and doing like a comparative project with today uh, and sort of pre-social network. And um, she reached out and talked to me and um, some other faculty. So she's just been doing outstanding um, research for her classes as well as just great performance in. And um, that is why this, book. I'm not trying to tell Gabriella anything about herself. Uh, so uh, I hope you enjoy it. And uh, congratulations to you, Gabriella. Rebecca Nason is um, in my modern and contemporary sculpture class. She uh, turned in a really fine final project that was very open and vulnerable, but also sort of displayed her depth of understanding of the course. And um, likewise, her, her discussion boards consistently uh, made sort of personal um, and deep connections to the work. So she's done a great job and thank you, Rebecca, and congratulations. Sophia Scott uh, is a diligent researcher 
Um, she's got great critical thinking and um, critical analysis skills. And like Sam, she gave really good feedback um, in the intro survey. So uh, always appreciate someone who responds to the peers in a thoughtful and uh, meaningful way, especially when we don't have in-class discussions. So thank you for that, Sophia, um, and congratulations. Um, Austin's story, uh, I have known now for four years and um, I'm very, very proud of Austin, uh, not just for his work in my class, which I think, I mean, it's always been good, but um, I think this year he's really grown um, and he's really good at reaching out to his peers and then sort of connecting the things that we're looking at to his personal work, which is also um, really incredible uh, and meaningful in process and subject matter. So um, I'm very, very proud of Austin um, and congratulations to Austin. Arland Wallace is a returning student who I may have tricked into becoming an art history major. Um, even though we have online classes, I feel like uh, I see Arland frequently because um, he emails to talk to me about the course material and tell me how it relates to his personal life and send me um, pictures of things that he sees that we've talked about in class, which is just invaluable when you're teaching an online class. Bob probably knows this. Sometimes it feels like you're, you know, shutting down a well. <laughs> There's nobody down there. Um, so I really appreciate Arland. Uh, and I know he's um, recently become interested in World War II history. So I hope you like this book uh, and you'll tell me if it's good. I would very much like to buy it, but I have like a 15 book to be read stock. So uh, thank you, Arlen, for brightening up my life uh, and congratulations. So our next award um, is given for growth as an art historian. Uh, not everybody starts out great. Um, I like to tell students that the very first paper I turn in in college, I didn't even get a grade on. The professor just wrote, oops, where's the rest of your paper? Um, and then uh, I went to talk to her and I uh, ended up taking several more classes with her. Shout out to Dr. Barbara Sikurgis. Um, So these are students who in their time with us have um, really grown into themselves. Um, so let's give out some awards. Uh, my first recipient is Victor Gomez. Um, Victor struggled a little bit at the beginning, but he came in to talk to me and he's really pushed through and grown, um, especially in his um, analysis and critical thinking skills. And I'm just really impressed with his commitment to his classes. So um, congratulations, Victor. Uh, Sari Jalali is uh, an intro, servant, intro student in my survey class. Uh, and she has been really amazing at taking feedback on the discussion boards and pushing to um, do deeper, more accurate and insightful research. Um, and she has really showed a lot of initiative and interest in her um, outside projects. So congratulations to Sarah. Brian, I have also known for um, quite some time and uh, Brian has taken a, a lot of initiative again to come and talk to me, um, to go over exam strategies, to figure out what crazy things I was looking for um, on my tests. And um, I just have been really impressed and um, could not be prouder of, of Brian and his work ethic. So congratulations, Brian. Uh, Anita Sims is the a rare student who has forced me to grow with her. Um, in addition to improving her own art history skills, she has pushed back and um, given me feedback that uh, I've really, really valued um, and has actually changed the way I teach my classes. I, re, um, I redesigned an entire intro survey based on a, a couple comments that Anita had made to me. Um, and it's hard to find a student that will push and challenge you like that. So I really appreciate her. Uh, she's made me grow as an art historian uh, as well. So thank you very much, Miss, Miss Anita. Uh, and congratulations to you. 
Um, and lastly, Anna Wren, um, who likewise um, has really grown in terms of critical thinking, visual analysis, and just um, research skills into a really outstanding um, art historian. And uh, I'm really excited and proud of her. And um, thank you very much for participating so enthusiastically in class. Uh, and congratulations to you, Anna. Um, so our next awards, uh, we have two for outstanding research. Um, the first was nominated by Ksenia Gerstein, the Curator of Modern and Contemporary Art uh, at the Ulrich Museum of Art, who is not me, um, as you can tell, um, but Ksenia could not be there. Um, so on her behalf, I have some words to read and I'm going to present this award to um, Kate Magathan. So Ksenia says, I am thrilled that Kate is receiving the award for an outstanding individual research project. It was a pleasure to, to have served as her mentor over the course of the spring semester. I asked Kate to look into scholarly materials related to several portfolios in the Ulrich Museum's collection that relate Native American sub subjects. The questions I asked Kate were open-ended and broad. I really appreciated her ability to find answers that were both relevant to the specific images in our collection and expansive in terms of their ability to shed light on key aspects of Native American experience from the beginning of European colonization of North America to the present day. Kate researched both widely and deeply and above all tenaciously, determined to find the answers to both my questions and to ones she developed along the way. I'm very pleased that the results of her work will eventually make it into um, the exhibition the Ulrich is planning for next year. And I applaud ADSI for helping bright and dedicated students such as Kate to develop and polish their research skills. Now I'd like to hand things over to Bob Workman for our second research award. Thanks, Brittany. Um... This past year, I had the um, pleasure to teach. I, um, oops, I don't have my video going, sorry. You can tell I don't do this very often. Um, this past year, I had the pleasure of teaching the two semester slow burn um, exhibition curation and presentation um, class. Um, our focus was um, the American art produced under the auspices of the Works Pro uh, Progress Administration through its numer uh, numerous fine arts programs between 1935 and 1943. The second semester of the class was uh, directed independent study on a topic of each student's uh, choosing, um, leading to a virtual exhibition and presentation to their peers. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to recognize uh, Joshua Cornett for the second Outstanding Research Award for his virtual exhibition entitled Ernest Smith Painting the Renaissance of Iroquois. Josh's project can best be summarized using his own words written as part of his exhibition introductory panel, and I'm going to quote uh, two sections from that. Quote, the Tribal League of the Haudenosaunee, commonly known as the Iroquois, faced centuries of oppression that had left their reservations poor and the people sick or starving, even before the Great Depression struck in 1929. Centuries old traditions were becoming known by fewer and fewer people in the process of being lost forever. However, in 1935, this process came to an abrupt stop. Among these many projects the WPPA funded, it was a more modest venture that saved the culture of the Haudenosaunee, the Seneca Arts Project. It involved just two Seneca reservations along with local tribal members. Organized and led by Seneca administrators, the project was an opportunity to end assimilation and bring about a new renaissance for their society. Playing his part was the Seneca painter, Ernest Smith. 
While working on the project, he depicted his culture and his people with dignity that they had long been denied. And that's uh, the end of his um, um, portion of his introductory panel. Uh, Josh identified this unique but somewhat forgotten cache of artwork uh, by Ernest Smith in the collections of the Rochester Museum and Science Center in New York. He extensively researched the Iroquois tribe's history, learned about many of the cultural artifacts depicted in the exhibition, reviewed hours of oral histories of the tribes, and produced an extremely engaging um, exhibition of over 60 artworks by Ernest Smith, accompanied by concise and insightful text panels and interpretive object labels. Um, Josh, I'm super proud of you. Um, you did an extraordinary job and um, I think you have a very bright future uh, as an art historian and I'd love to see you think seriously about the possibilities of museum work in the future. And with that, um, it, I will turn it over to Jeff Pulaski. All right, great. Um, although this event celebrates the study of art history, we also wanna take this opportunity to recognize uh, outstanding graduates in art education, graphic design, studio art, as well as some outstanding or an outstanding graduate student uh, in the program. So. Uh, first, we're going to do the outstanding graduate student, and that's Grant Downing. Uh, we can advance the slide one more, I think. Oh, one more. There we go. Grant Downing. So I'm going to read a quote from um, Ted Adler, who uh, was one of the people, one of actually many people who nominated Grant. If you saw Grant Downing's thesis exhibition, Nothing to No One, then you know why he has been selected for this award. What Grant was able to achieve in that show was the realization of a deeply felt personal truth that was supported by a strong grasp of the historical and theoretical context of the work and ideas, which were then masterfully brought into material form. While many of our graduate students are equally deserving of this praise, Grant's use of techniques and materials expand the ceramic vocabulary and bring it into context conversation with, theory, with social theories and philosophies about exclusion and marginality in a singularly impressive way. His thesis exhibition transformed our perception of the objects it presented, as well as the space itself. Moreover, if you've ever had the opportunity to have a conversation with Grant, then you also know why he has been selected for this award. Grant's low-key demeanor and good humor radiate his liberty and overall positive outlook. His leadership as a treasurer of the WSU Ceramics Guild has also largely contributed to the success of many of our sales and fundraisers. Thanks, Grant, for all of your work. You'll definitely be missed. And I agree. So congratulations to Grant. Next, our outstanding art education graduate is Emily Cass. Um, I'm going to read a statement from Lori Santos, who's the uh, head of the art education program. I cannot say enough wonderful things about Emily Cass. It is my pleasure to nominate such a deserving and dedicated art teacher candidate to be the WSU Art Education Student of the Year for 2021. Emily has a unique combination of being skillful, knowledgeable, and caring educator. During her student teaching internship this past school year, she was able to creatively bridge her remote and face-to-face K-12 students to come up with innovative lesson plans that were personally meaningful, meaningful for all of her students. Emily reaches beyond formal styles of teaching to embrace concepts that are important for, all, for us all within the realms of the social and cultural to create lesson plans that speak to our times. She understands the value of cultivating student voice and building community. As a leader who is mindful of critical topics, she led her high school students through explorations of identity, place, and mindfulness. For example, her curriculum incorporated activist-based contemporary Native American artists such as Wendy Reed Star, Wendy Red Star, I'm sorry, and introduced her students to decolonized and critical conversations about Native American identity. Emily thinks deeply about human-centered ideas and future community uh, sustainability. She participated in a community-based service project such as the mural at St. Patrick's Catholic School in Wichita. 
She was a part of the WSU Art Education team with Storytime Village and our Little Free Library Project uh, was a finalist for the WSU Service Learning Award. Emily Cass is a dedicated and enthusiastic art educator and is truly appreciated for ex her exceptional work and foresight to take the initiative to research topics and discover new resources and ideas to share. I look forward to seeing the grand, con uh, the, the grand contribution she will continue to make to the field of art education. And I have to say, um, you know, I'm, I'm impressed with, with all of our students, but our art education students in their final year this year, um, not only had to do their schooling, they had to go out and teach in the public schools and they had to teach remote. And for those of us who've been teachers for five, 10, 20, 30 years, it was a difficult transition for these young students who are um, just getting started and being kind of thrown into the fire. Uh, so to speak, um, I'm very impressed with the work that they were able to do. So congratulations, uh, Emily Cass. Next, uh, we'll have our outstanding graphic design student, which is Cooper Blasky. Um, the graphic design faculty, oh, I'm going to read a statement from Irma Skarvich. Uh, the graphic design faculty thought it was very important for this award to go to a designer with exceptional work, and Cooper definitely produces that. He is an excellent visual thinker. His work is also consist, consist, constantly sorry, improving as he learns and grows as a graphic designer. So congratulations, Cooper. This is very well deserved. I think you're going to have a great career. So uh, the next person is uh, outstanding studio art graduate, and that's Shante Levine. Uh, Marco Hernandez, who's one of her professors, says Shante has always shown a positive out attitude and a great work ethic in the printmaking studio. She is shown to be a great leader by taking the role of president of the Printmaking Guild, Tornado Alley Press. She has participated and worked various department events, including exhibition installations, art workshops, art sales, artist lectures, and helped organize events with Shift Space. She is an all around positive, friendly, and humble young woman. Her art making skills and positive attitude have earned her the respect of many art students at WSU. And it has been a pleasure to have her as a student. And so, Congratulations, congratulations to Shante. Um, and now we'd like to wrap things up with um, Outstanding Art History graduate. And once again, here's Brittany Lockard. Uh, I would just like to add that most of our outstanding um, ATC grads were also outstanding art historians, um, especially uh, Emily and, and Shante, who is also an outstanding fashion icon of the school. Um, so, uh, but I'm here to talk about the Outstanding Art History graduate who is Nellie Elliott. Um, Nellie uh, is also beloved not just by the art history faculty, but also by the Ulrich, um, where she served as one of their interns um, and um, worked on a number of really important projects for them, including Wikipedia edit-a-thons to add more entries on women artists. Um, she's volunteered at the Anthropology Museum on campus um, and just been um, all around fantastic to work with. Uh, I recently completed an independent study with Nellie um, where she produced um, honestly a graduate level research paper on William Merritt Chase in which she made the argument that he constructed um, a new kind of American identity uh, and painting through uh, references to European Baroque uh, fashion and new more impressionistic rendering style. Um, it was just absolutely fantastic. Um, she's uh, all around a very nice person and uh, a star. She was recently featured in the Sunflower. Um, don't let the one T in her last name confuse you. That is indeed R. Nellie Elliott. Uh, we're, we're very proud. I know you're going to do great things um, in uh, graduate school for conservation and um, I'm going to miss you. I'm sure that the older staff is, is going to miss you very much, um, but congratulations, Nellie. Uh, and then I just have very, very brief closing remarks, which is um, one, congratulations to all of the winners. Um, to thank you again to the Ulrich Museum of Art for very generously agreeing to host this event well before you knew it would be virtual. Um, especially thanks to Jana Irwin, who just really makes my life easier. 
Um, thank you. I'll thank you every year, Jeff Pulaski, for saying yes when I asked if we could do this uh, and also giving us money. Um, it's so great. Uh, thank you for everyone who, who won an award because you've really made our lives um, better as uh, people and as faculty. And thank you everyone who came, um, especially at the, at the end of a, a semester full of Zoom. So that's everything I have to say. Thanks again. Um, and good night and good luck. <laughs>